So, <clears throat> so we're now on the record. We few who show up on time, that is to say, everyone else will have to join us eventually. But they miss out on all this, all the opportunities for lively banter at the beginning of class, right? So who had a good weekend? Anyone? Mine was marred by the loss the Buckeyes suffered yesterday to Michigan of all, of all teams, but. I mean, it was a good game though. It was a great game. It, it was really a really was. good game. It really was, I agree, I agree. I just Came down basically just the uh, behind the back steal. What was that? What was that guy thinking? I know. It was, was so painful thinking? to watch. What was he thinking? <laughs> yeah, I know. But yes, I, if if they have to lose, at least they they didn't get blown out, and they lost in a game that was exciting to watch. So right, there's something to be said for that. Hi, Jin Ying. Good morning. Hi. And unlike the football season, one loss doesn't uh, destroy the whole season. So. Um, we can still hold out hope for our Buckeyes. Are they going to do March Madness? Do you know? Yes, yes, they are. They though are? It's, okay. though it's, uh, I think all of the teams will be uh, assembled in, um, in in Indianapolis, something, something like that. There's going to be some, uh, and careful protocols about who can interact with whom and who's. That sounds like it's going to be really long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, and and there won't be a, a Big Ten tournament. They'll decide the champion based on the winning percentage, which I guess is reasonable. That's how yeah. it was done in the olden days. Um, so, well, uh, looks like your classmates are hors de combat. I don't know where they are. We can. I can't summon them up out of out of nothingness. I have to. So, hmm. I thought maybe break started today. No. <laughs> There's Jackie. Okay, thank you for I showing wish up. Wish break started today. <laughs> if you wish. <laughs> no offense, like this class, but you know, three day weekend would be even better. A three-day weekend that would no, stretch into an, into an eight-day an eight-day weekend or yeah I don't know yeah. whatever whatever it is <laughs> yeah well I am I am grateful for a break you know, even if it's just two days I must say um, but uh, yeah but I I mean I I thought it actually given given the uh, the interest in trying to keep people on campus with or, or you know, not not roaming about the country in any case. Uh, I, I think the the plan to have these two two day breaks was was a reasonable uh, reasonable compromise. But uh, and yeah, and <clears throat> I'm grateful for any any break at this point because it's 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 been intense. The, the, the t teaching uh, online. It's, I, I didn't realize everything I I've been. All of all the materials that I've used in the past, everything has had to be completely redone. So I'm always, I always feel like I'm like I'm playing catch up, so to speak, uh, waiting to uh, just getting things ready just in time. It might look like I'm well prepared, but uh, I don't know whether that's true or not. But uh, the the reality is that um, you know it's a scramble, even up to a couple minutes before class. But anyway, it looks like we are. Uh, slowly gathering we've got just barely a 50 percent or 51 percent uh quorum which i guess is enough for us to start so let's let's get going uh, and the others well who knows what what brilliant insights they will miss by tuning in late huh so my uh we welcome you all to this we're now in week uh week seven so we're really at the halfway mark for the uh for the semester so um let me review just quickly what what the next two weeks will uh entail because the, there there are some um things that are a bit different first of all as as you know and as we were saying the we have our two-day mid 
semester instructional break starting tomorrow, tomorrow and Wednesday. So we have no class on Wednesday. There's no assignment of any sort that um, we've been asked to make sure that you uh, that you really use it as a break. And so I encourage you to uh, to unplug and uh, you know de disengage from from schoolwork and just uh, you know relax and take a few deep breaths and uh, and enjoy the, uh, the, t the time. The weather is getting a little nicer. It's going to be warmer this week. So it's, we'll go out and get some fresh air. Um, uh, there's still snow on the ground. So if you, you can go sledding, make a snowman, whatever. But in any case, treat it as an instructional, as a real break from instruction. That's, that's what, uh, that's what you, should, you should be doing. That's the intent of this uh, two-day mid-semester break. So no class on Wednesday, that's, that's a, a, a key thing. And no assignments either, that's also uh, in keeping with the, the idea of <clears throat> taking a break. Um, after the break, however, we do have to return to some, uh, to the reality of, of the uh, uh, class and, and such. So then on Monday, a week from today, on, on Monday, you will get the first problem set um, it, it will be made available during during our class uh, session, uh, or probably at the beginning of, of, of class. You'll have a week to work on it. I, as I think I explained in the uh, in the early days of the semester when I was going over the syllabus with you, and if you read the syllabus as you were supposed to, and, and as I know you all did because you found Snoop Dogg embedded in the uh, in the syllabus, um, the um, the problem sets, I, as I explain them, are kind of like uh, homework assignments on steroids. They're they're all of the things that are that I ask for in the problem set uh, are the kinds of exercises that you've been doing <clears throat> for your homework assignments and the kinds of things that we've been um, going over in class. So I don't think there will be any surprises there. The data will be different, of course, because it's I can't I can't just recycle the same material that you've already uh, worked on, but it'll, it'll be asking for familiar kinds of things. So you will have to reconstruct, you will have to talk about sound changes, uh, you'll have to figure out environments for sound changes, you'll have to think about uh, the ordering of, of changes, <clears throat> how you get from one, one stage to another stage, you'll have to be, pay attention to principles like Occam's razor, like uh, the phonetic character of sound change, the regularity of sound change, and so forth. All of the things that we've been emphasizing over the last uh, uh, six weeks uh, will, will be crystallized in the uh, problem set. It is, it is long, I, I, I admit that. There's several things that I ask of you, but I will, uh, I will try to walk you through it. I'll ask you to read the instructions very, very carefully. I'll say this again on uh, next Monday. Read the instructions very, very carefully and do just what I ask you to do. Don't do more, don't do less. Just focus on what I ask you. And if you don't understand what, what I'm asking, then raise your hand, well, the equivalent of raising your hand. <clears throat> um, shoot me an email and let me know uh, where, what, what, is, uh, what is confusing or what, what uh, you don't understand so we can, uh, everyone can be on the same page. Okay, so that, that will be next. Um, Next Monday, that will be available to you. You will have a week to work on it. Uh, so that you don't uh, get um, uh, sort of bollocked up with uh, more new material on uh, next week, during the week that you're working on the, on the uh, problem set, I've arranged on uh, Wednesday of that week, that's on March 3rd, uh, I've arranged for a, uh, a former advisee of mine who has a doctorate in, uh, in uh, English and English historical linguistics to give a lecture uh, to the class on the history of English. She's done this before, actually every year for the past several years. Uh, she's a very good, very good lecturer and, and it's interesting material and history of English is something that everyone in the class has some uh, stake in because you're all either users or speakers of of, uh, of of English, you are living history, as it were, 
uh, for the for the English language, and she'll uh, talk about the the uh, deeper roots of English and the developments that uh, that we've only touched on very briefly between Old English and Middle English and Modern English. Um, her name is Bethany Christensen. She took this class with uh, the, the class that you guys are taking. I guess it was now seven years ago, um, and she went on to do a PhD in the English department, spe specializing in. Uh, Old English and Anglo-Saxon uh, studies. So that'll be a change of pace. You won't have to listen to me. You can listen to someone else uh, hold forth. And she has very interesting uh, things to say. Um, so the <clears throat> the one the one uh, sort of add-on over the uh, the time over next week when you're you're working on the uh, on the um, on the problem set is that I I will ask you by next by a week from Friday, uh, March fifth. Uh, I want you to tell me what your uh, topic, uh, what you're thinking of as the topic for your term paper assignment. So, and I've actually made that into a, a homework assignment. It's assignment number 11. If you look on the, on, on uh, Carmen, you'll see that on the assignment list. Um, and it's, and uh, I explain what I want there and, and I want you to, to refer to the uh, term paper assignment. So if you haven't, if you haven't done that, if you haven't looked at it at all, sometime between now and a week from Friday, that is between now and March 5th, you should um, spend a little bit of time reading over the term paper assignment and thinking about what you want to uh, to do. Okay, so that's the um, that's sort of the next two weeks. So it's a, they're somewhat unusual. There's no no class on Wednesday, uh, and we have this a guest lecture a week from Wednesday, and you'll have the midterm or not midterm, sorry, the problem set uh, uh, to contend with starting uh, next Monday. Okay, any questions on any of that? I just wanted to, to make sure that everyone is aware of what uh, what's coming up. All right, looks like everyone's happy. Okay, good, good, good. All right, thank you. Um, so let me share my screen and I want to uh, start with a virtual t-shirt. I don't, I'm not wearing, not wearing it today. I just have a, a plain old nothing t-shirt on, but I found a virtual t-shirt that I've, that I've ordered. It just hasn't arrived yet called, uh, which has this on it, your asterisk. And I'm not sure what it's supposed to, what the asterisk is doing there. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, supposed to make you think about the different spellings, Y-O-U-R, as opposed to Y-O-U apostrophe R-E. Um, but uh, I thought in particular, this asterisk is highly relevant to what we do in, in this class. And I've noticed uh, I, in looking at your homework assignments, I noticed that there's still some of you who, who are not putting the asterisk on your reconstructed uh, sounds and your reconstructed uh, uh, words and forms and so forth. So this t-shirt is uh, meant to be a reminder that we take these asterisks uh, seriously. Would, would someone, um, just like to uh, explain what the what the uh, purpose of the asterisk is, what it signals. Anyone uh, anyone want to take that? Why do why do we why do we affix an asterisk to the our reconstructed uh, elements, sounds, words, ending, morphemes, whatever? Anyone? Well. I can give it a shot. Okay, go for it. Um, well, if you have an opinion on the internet and you spell that kind of your Y-O-U-R-E, then your entire argument will crumble because you spelled it wrong. So the re person who will reply to you will just say that and that alone. Sorry, the rest of your opinion doesn't matter because you spelled this word wrong. Ha ha, loser. Um, but I don't recommend that you do that. That I do what? That you reply to someone just oh. correcting their word. <laughs> <I see. laughs> Fair enough. And okay, so that's what that's what this means. Now, what do what does the asterisk mean for us in uh, in our historical exercises? It doesn't mean you're a loser, right? Yeah. It, what does it mean? Well, if we we use it before our like protophonemes and stuff, I think it's just is it hypothesize exactly reconstruction. Yes. Exactly. So it, it stands, it, it's a way of signaling that, that what, you're, uh, what you are, uh, what comes after it is a hypothesis 
it's something that is hypothetical. It's, it, you're not sure that it ever occurred, but you are hypothesizing its existence. It's unattested. And the asterisk is another way of saying that it's unattested, but hypothetical. So it's, it's not at all uh, that you're a loser or anything like that. In fact, it shows that you understand the, what, what the whole enterprise uh, is of, uh, of, uh, of reconstruction and trying to recover earlier stages of a, of a language or a language family. So um, yeah, so that's, so that's what it does there. It's, it's, it's a way of signaling that, <clears throat> that our uh, analysis uh, has an element of, of, uh, of uh, hypothetical, has a hypothetical uh, aspect to it. It's a hypothesis about an earlier state. It's not a directly attested earlier state. So this this T-shirt doesn't exactly say that, and I, I appreciate your uh, explaining the uh, the the uh, um, the import of of this. But from our point of view, asterisks are good, and they tell us something. And they and if you use them properly, then it uh, it's really a a guide to your to showing the reader that you that you uh, are uh, what you're engaging in, the kind of of enterprise that you're engaging in. Okay. So I guess I, I'm not wrong to uh, to I hope I'm not wrong to include this in our in our linguistically uh, relevant uh, T-shirts. And I, when I get it, I, if I, it should arrive one of these days, uh, and I will I will uh, display I will proudly wear it, and you can you can make fun of me and tell me I'm a loser if you want or not, as the case may be. Okay, so. Uh, my, the first order of business is I want to go over the, uh, this Indo-Iranian problem that you all suffered with to, uh, over the weekend. Um, mostly you did fine, and I've, I've, uh, uh, I think I've graded all of them uh, and retur retur you know, re returned them with comments to you by now. Maybe there are a couple that are, that are missing. A few of you still owe, them, uh, owe me uh, some, and I will uh, look forward to getting them, even if they're late. Um, but the, I, I tried to, to make this as circumscribed a, a, an exercise as possible. And that's why I told you to just concentrate on the correspondences involving voiceless stops in Sanskrit and nothing else. Um, <clears throat> and uh, and I, 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 for the problem set, uh, set, by the way, I will try to give you very explicit instructions about what you, what you are to do and uh, so that it, it can be kind of a paint by number working through the, the exercise. You still, you still are gonna to have to show me that you understand what you're doing, but I'll try to be as explicit as possible so that there's no room for, uh, for, uh, for mistakes or misunderstandings. So the first uh, task at hand was to figure out what the regular correspondences are. I drew your attention to anything having a voiceless stop in Sanskrit. I told you not to worry about the, the ch because it's an affricate, even though technically it has a stop, some stoppage to it. And technically, uh, actually, the Sanskrit grammarians describe it as a palatal uh, stop. But for our purposes, it was, it was irrelevant. So you just have to worry about uh, things, correspondences involving PT and K in, in, uh, in Sanskrit. <clears throat> and as most of you uh, realized, the um, let me take this data and put it on a new document so we can, here we go. Um, actually, I know what I'll do. In class notes, here we are in my virtual, oh, okay, sorry, I already did it. Um, the uh, Indo-Iranian reconstruction then starts with this data set and the most, for the most part, things were pretty straightforward. You have uh, the Ks matching up in, uh, well, let me, let me put it in a different color. You have the Ks matching up in uh, the first word quite straightforwardly. You then look at the rest of the data and see that they, uh, there's another instance of exactly the same exactly the same elements. Some of you were concerned about, as always, you were concerned about the environments and you say, well, this, this first one has uh, K corresponding to 
k corresponding to k before a a short a this one that's in the first one number one and the other one has k corresponding to k corresponding to k before a uh, a long a and the question is does this matter long a versus short a anyone want to want to uh, tackle that I've, I've talked about, about um, the sort of procedure that we follow <clears throat> by, uh, in terms of the degree of granularity of the environment and really our statement about it. And, and, what, and that, what that's equivalent to is, is how detailed is the environment. That, uh, <clears throat> and when you first start, the, the very first, your very first pass, <clears throat> through the um, through the uh, exercise, do you know how detailed you have to be? Anyone? We have to detail everything that is important. Well, first of all, we detail everything. And then after we generalize to detail what is important. Right. So you, you start out by saying, I don't know, maybe the difference between short A and long A matters. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does, but you start out by noting it, but you don't stop at that point. So this is, this is sort of, this here is, is giving you what we might call um, descriptive adequacy. That is, it describes what's going on, but the next step is to uh, arrive at some, uh, at some, uh, you might say, analytic adequacy. That is, you in you, the first step, you just describe what's there. The second step is you do some interpretation, some analysis. You, you interpret your what you've uh, uh, the interpretation of the of the uh, sort of descriptive uh, statement that you have or statements that you have. And that's, that's really what, uh, and this is, I've been trying to emphasize that what we do is, is science and this is really what, uh, what is involved in the, the scientific method. You describe first and then you analyze. And does it ultimately, uh, there, does it ultimately matter uh, whether we're dealing with short A or long A here? What, what, what about these two statements tells you that it doesn't, it doesn't matter? There's one key fact about these two statements that tells you ultimately that, that, that this is too fine a, you're, you're being too detailed, you're, it's too granular. And what is, what is that, what, what observation can you make about these two uh, statements? This is a very obvious answer, but I want someone to say it because, because I, I, I fear that sometimes the, because we don't say the obvious, it, it kind of gets shunted aside. So the same, what it, oh, sorry. No, no, please, please. please. Um, the same correspondence occur in like both environments? Yes, exactly. These are the identical correspondences, the same elements in, with, distributed in the same way across the, across the languages. So it, if you look at this fact that we have a K corresponding to a K corresponding to a K before a short A, and K corresponding to K corresponding to K before a long A, that suggests that it really doesn't matter whether it's a long or a short A. Um, and in fact, you can, you might even go, and that's why I ask you to, to uh, in your analytic adequacy, after you describe things, I ask, ask you to generalize. Um, so detailed at the start, followed by, um, uh, generalizing as much as the data allows. <clears throat> and that's, and so you look at these and you say, it doesn't look like the vowel, like the quality of the, or quantity of the vowel makes a difference at all. Therefore, how would you generalize this? How would you uh, generalize the, uh, this the, over these two? Anyone? Most of you did this, so. 
but I want I want someone to say it because I, I really think it's good to say the obvious sometimes. What do we put here for the environment? Just any vowel. Yeah, any vowel. And that then becomes important when you look at the other uh, the other uh, correspondence set involving a Sanskrit K, and that's what we see here. I'll put it in a different color at, at first because we don't know. And so descriptively, what do we see in this in this set? Well, we have a K in Sanskrit, that much is our starting point. And what else do we see? Again, an obvious answer, but I want someone to say it. No one? Uh, uh, huh. Yeah, thank you. Who said that? Who is who is the brave soul who said that? No, I'm not gonna. I, I didn't. I didn't. Marcia. Ah, Marcia. Good for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. So there's a h here, and what else do we find? H. Also h. Now, the question is, where do we find it? And first of all, uh, I should ask: Is there another example of that anywhere anywhere in the data set? Another example of K corresponding to H corresponding to H. The word with powder, power. Power, exactly, right. So we see it also here with, in the word for with power. Yes, good. And we, we and what is, and what do we, we have this then before, uh, before a uh, sh, retroflex sh, palatal and palatal sh, and what do we and what's the environment in uh, in the word with power? Uh, so initially and before a consonant. Right. Yeah. So in this, so first we have it in in this case with uh, with the sh, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. We also have it in. Uh, in the case before R. We don't know whether initial position matters or not, so we, we can note it here. But in the same way that we said that, that we can generalize over these two, because it doesn't look like the vowel really matters, uh, which vowel matters, rather just that there is a vowel. And when we, <clears throat> when we compare these, we, we, we end up, as, uh, as uh, Jin Yi said, being able to say that, um, that we can generalize, oops, we can generalize over these and say we have the K, H, H correspondence before a consonant. And then we're at a point where we can, uh, well, I should use a different color because we are trying to decide what's going on here. Um, do magenta, I think that's magenta. And then we can, we, uh, can look at these and say, so, um, what is going on with with these two? What is the relationship of these two? And why would we even care what the relationship might be? Why would we why 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 would we be looking at those two and, and even wondering about the relationship between them? Anyone? If they're in complementary distribution, they might have the same protophoneme. Right. So if they're in complementary distribution, then they might then then we can um, trace them back to the starting to the same starting point. And why would we think that these two might might uh, derive from a, a, the same starting point? Because I will answer this for you. Because they're they're similar. They're not identical, but they're similar. These involve velar stops. These involve velar obstruents stops and fricatives. So there's something similar about them that, that should make you think, wait a minute, maybe I need to pay special attention to these two. And uh, as we were just told, these are in fact in, so th this, is, this is a good, uh, th th this is your first step and you've done a bit of analysis in generalizing the environment. 
But then you go further and say, so what about these, uh, these two? These are two interesting ones to look at because they are similar, but not identical. When they're identical like this, then you generalize. When they're similar like this, then you have to do a bit of analysis, a bit of interpretation about the uh, in environments. And uh, as we were just told, these are complementary in complementary distributions. And what does that mean? So complementary, therefore, so complementary, therefore, what, what conclusion do we draw from them being, being complementary? Anyone? Most of you did. Most of you got this. So I just want to, but I, so I know that most of you should be able to answer this. I'm going to reconstruct K. Yeah. So we can reconstruct K for both sets. And that, my friends, is a good result. You should be happy with that. Complementary, we can reconstruct K for both sets. Now, what is it that that what is it about the complementary distribution that a lot that that really forces us to um, why why is why is it why is it even an issue uh, trying to uh, determine what the distribution is and why and what does what does our asterisk speaking of the importance of asterisks what are we what claims are we making about the history of these of these languages? Uh, by reconstructing a single sound for these two sets. This should be pretty much automatic by now because we've been doing it so much of it. And, uh, and I'm, this is my, my last chance to get you, to get us all on the same page as far as the uh, method is concerned. Anyone? What, 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 what claim is embodied in this reconstruction? And that's why I ask you to be explicit about the changes that that uh, that are uh, that are part of your um, uh, uh, part of your overall analysis and stating what the changes are. So what 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 change what statement of change is embodied or statement of historical development is embodied in this reconstruction? The parent language had K, and then Old Persian and Avestan had K go uh, become a fricative. Right. So we have K becoming a fricative where? Uh, before consonants. Before consonants in, and we, we could be explicit and say in Old Persian and in Avestan. Okay, good. And what happens to K in other environments, in particular? before vowel. Stays the same. Stays the same, right. And, and I've, I, I, we, I, I've mentioned several times that we pay more attention to the changes and we state what the changes are because we make the default assumption that unless something specifically happens, things will stay the same. But it's a statement of the history of the, of the development into Old Persian and into Avestan that K stays as a K before a vowel, but uh, turns into a H before a, a consonant. And similar things happen with the P's and similar things happen with the K's, uh, with the T's, I won't go, go through that. But it does, I, 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 is, everyone, is everyone clear about, about this? this? This is the method that, we, the method that we've been uh, advocating for and building up to and, and, and illustrating um, again and again and again. So I, I'm hoping that, it, that it's beginning to get uh, sort of ingrained in, in, your, in your thinking. And what this allows us to do, this allows for, uh, well, our understanding of the development here to be consistent with regularity of sound change. And at the moment, we're, we're treating regularity of sound change as a principle that guides our, uh, our uh, thinking and, and uh, sort of built into the idea of regularity of sound change because of, um, because of this statement here of, <clears throat> of 
change. It's, uh, it's governed only by phonetic factors. So that's why, that's why I want you to, um, hang on a sec, I'll get back to where we're. That's why I want you to, to think when you, when you start out by saying, well, we have this set before an, a short A and this set before a long A. I want you to think, does it matter? Does the vowel quality matter? Because our understanding of sound change is not only that it's regular, but also uh, that it is uh, regularity of sound change and the corollary that is the, the additional um, corollary that sound change is only phonetically determined. That we type. <clears throat> so that's that's our understanding of sound change, and that's what informs the way we uh, our, we uh, devise our, our method. That we can explain the difference between these these two outcomes in terms of the difference in the environment. That's consistent with regularity of sound change. We would want to be able to say, so what is the phonetic nature of that environment that drives it in that way? And some of you wondered about that. What is it about, about uh, <clears throat> a K before a, uh, a, another consonant that might drive it in the direction of a H? And it really comes down to a matter of the release, that in a cluster, you get a different kind of release of the, of the uh, uh, gestures that produce a K. You get a different kind of release from the release that you get uh, before a vowel. So the, um, the um, release is impeded in some way by the, by the uh, following consonant. And one way of getting around that impediment is by uh, not stopping the air altogether, but just letting the air flow through, into the, uh, through and across the next sound. So that, and that gives you a fricative. So we can make phonetic sense of it. And ultimately that's what we would want to do for all of the, our statements of sound change. Okay, so this, this should be, as I say, uh, almost <clears throat> ingrained in you by now, but uh, I, here and there in, in your, in, in your uh, answers, I sometimes see little, uh, little uh, holes in the, in the dike or whatever that need to be plugged with our, with our fingers. So I want, that's why I like to go, go back over this to make sure we're all on the same page. Now, there was something that I did um, here uh, kind of, Without uh, without uh, comment, and I'd like to uh, to come back to that. If if you look at the at the actual facts here about the K, H, and H environment, uh, notice that I said it's before a sh, but it's a sh in Old Persian and a sh in Avestan, but in Sanskrit it's a it's not the palatal sh, but rather a retroflex. It's s with with a dot under it, a retroflex. So it uh, very often uh, turns out that we, uh, so sh in Old Persian and Avestan, but uh, the S with a dot under it, I'll write the dot next to it, retroflex in Sanskrit. So it very often is the case <clears throat> that we need to in our statements, we need, we're dealing with environments that don't match. They're similar in some ways. So these are both uh, consonants and ultimately, ultimately that maybe is all that matters. But the environments are, are not always uh, identical. They don't always match. And this is where we've run into a bit of, of, of problems, uh, some, some, some difficulties, um, <clears throat> because you, you're stuck, you say, well, wait a minute, do I, and, and some of you have, have said it in exactly these terms in your homework assignments, do I state the environment in terms of what's in language A, or do I state the environment in terms of what's in language B or language C, what do I do? And we've run into this uh, several times. Uh, I'd like to, to talk through that with regard to the, uh, the somewhat complex uh, facts that you see in, in this one, words like uh, the word for, for um, for sun, where you have this TR in the middle of the word in Sanskrit, you have this tense S like thing in uh, Old Persian, and you have a theta and R a thra in Avestan. 
So we're really dealing then with we're really dealing with two with one re, with with uh, one set of of uh, of reflexes that you were supposed to focus on, namely the T, the um, uh, tense S, and the theta, and an environment that is that doesn't match up because there's an R in the Sanskrit and the Avestan, and just a vowel uh, following in the uh, in the um, Old Persian. So what we're really dealing with then is what is two sets of reflexes. The um, the T tense S theta reflex and the R zero because there's nothing after the, there's nothing that corresponds directly to an R here and R reflex so really two reflexes two sets that we're dealing with this set of T tense S and theta and this set of R zero I'll put the zero in here so we can um, um, <clears throat> just to, to make it uh, crystal clear what we're what we're dealing with there. So we really then have a what we might call a composite reflex of TR tense S and zero and theta and R. Okay. Does does everyone everyone see that? What we're I mentioned, I, I think this came up last week when we were uh, talking about these kinds of, of uh, situations. I didn't have a term for it, but I'm, I've invented this term composite reflex. So these are really, the, the environment is it, itself a correspondence set that can be subject to change. That's what I said last week and that, and that still holds. And this is just a way of schematizing it a little, a little more clearly, I think. Now, on the assumption that in general, and some of you have, have, have come to this conclusion on your own, actually, though we haven't stated it as such uh, overtly, but in general, it's easier to start with something that is in the proto-language and delete it than it is to insert it out of nothing. And what we really see here is that there's the possibility, since we have it, we're dealing with a zero, there's a possibility of, of starting with an R and deleting it in, in old Persian, or starting with, uh, starting with a zero and inserting an R in Sanskrit and Avesta. So, and I want you to, to concentrate here on these. Let me, let me, let me add this. Uh, zero here just to, so it's I want you to concentrate on this sort of composite reflex either we start with an R and get rid of it in old Persian or we start with a zero and add an R in Sanskrit and Avestan those are really the two possibilities when you have a mismatch involving uh, the environments uh, the, where the environments don't match up or, or any sounds that don't match up and if we start with the assumption that it's generally easier to posit something for the proto-language and then delete it than to insert it out of nothing, then we would uh, have uh, a reason for, for thinking that this reconstruction of, uh, with, with, with an R is a better reconstruction than starting with, with a zero. And I'll put, it, I'll put the zero in there. And can anyone um, think about why that might be, uh, why this might be a, a, a general, uh, a reasonable step to keep in mind as, as, we're, as we're trying to decide on reconstructions. Why is it easier to start with something and get rid of it than to insert, insert it out of nothing? Because you need a justification to insert something, but not really to delete it. Exactly, right. So, uh, and this comes back to the question of the phonetically phonetic determination of sound change. So, if there's a, uh, if, if you if you think about it, there's zeros everywhere, right? So, I could, I, mean, I, I, I wrote that as tr, but I could really uh, sort of revise that as um, as that there's a zero before the t. There's the t. There's a zero after the t. There's an r. There's an, a zero after the R, 
So zeros are everywhere. You can't see them because they're zeros. But in a sense, the ze zero is everywhere. So to say, well, I'm going to take this particular zero and say, oh, that one and that one alone um, gives me a turns into a. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This one shouldn't be here. That one and that one alone uh, turns into a an R. Then, as Jackie said, you, we want to know what the motivation is. Why should that zero turn into an R? And why R as opposed to as opposed to an L, as opposed to an N, as opposed to uh, an S, as opposed to any other any other sound that it could turn that that the zero could turn into. So, and that's why, and that's and it's it's for those that that reason uh, really having to do with the phonetic motivation that we say it's easier to start with something and delete it than it is to insert it out of nothing because the the, the question, um, it's a question of motivation and especially phonetic motivation. Okay, so faced with a situation like this, when we, when we have these composite reflexes, we're inclined in that we, we have to deal with them somehow. And if we say, if we start with, a, with the R in our reconstruction, we say that's better than starting with a zero and just inserting a uh, uh, an R. Why R and why that? Why afterwards and when there's actually a zero before the T and and so forth, then um, <clears throat> then we can uh, kind of take a a free ride on the uh, no, notice that the um, uh, the T corresponds to a theta, corresponds to a theta before W. Well, a W is, a, is another consonant. So that's just like the K, uh, H, H before a consonant. So we can make a generalization over what happens to P, T, and K when they occur before a consonant in Old Persian and Avestan. And then we're beginning to develop a an, an analytic, analytically very adequate account that is general, that is that answers to phonetic motivation, that uh, answers to regularity of sound change, and um, it an answers to uh, Occam's uh, par parsimony really by giving us a by not multiplying proto language entities needlessly. Okay, <clears throat> so so we need so in general in these composite cases, we need to reconcile environments that don't match. Now, I'm going to give you another example of that. Um, <clears throat> remember with Gibe, there was one, there was one detail that was left uh, hanging from our, uh, our uh, account of Gibe, and that was what to do about, you know, remember we had, we had no problems here reconstructing a T for this first set of uh, T everywhere, S for the set that had an S everywhere. We finally decided that because all of these sets overlapped before a high toned open O, remember that environment, high toned open O, um, that we needed to reconstruct something different for the third set of that had T's and S's and we reconstructed a S for that and a dental or uh, a dental, um, uh, Africa, so, and we also had this. This is what sort of made it complicated to a point where you were probably having nightmares about Africans. Uh, that there was also this pre, uh, or was it pre-palatal? I think it was. It was described as uh, t, t, like that, based on this correspondence set, which also occurred before a high-toned open O. So these four sets here gave four distinct proto-language segments because they all uh, overlap in uh, before high-toned open O. So overlapping distribution before high-toned open O. 
But then we also had this, this last one, 14 through, in 14 through 17, where there were some, some familiar looking elements, but distributed in a different way. And this new sound here, this uh, uh, sibilant, uh, prepalatal sibilant. And at the time we just said, look, it also occurs before high toned open O. So we reconstruct something, uh, something different. And there was a lot of, there was some debate or at least to judge from your ass uh, assignments. It couldn't be a tsu because that was already used. It couldn't be the chi because that was already used. So it was something else. And some of you thought, well, maybe it's a, uh, maybe it's a, a theta or something else uh, altogether. Um, <clears throat> but, and this is where things get a little bit interesting, uh, drawing uh, or, or thinking back to this question of cases where the environments don't match and are needing to reconcile these mismatches in the environment somehow. Um, remember that there was also in 14 through 17, there was also this pesky little Y that occurred in, in two of the instances. Um, and we never, we never completely answered that, but now we're in a point, we're at a point where we can say, we really have a composite reflex here. We have the t, 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 t set. And we also have zero, 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 y and y. So we're really in the same situation as we were back here with our, uh, with our old Persian composite reflex. And Keeping in mind what we said here, this general statement about, <clears throat> about uh, the advantages of deleting, starting with something and deleting it over, inserting it out of the blue, what can we do here with this composite reflex? Anyone wanna, anyone wanna guess at what comes next down here? Maybe a palatal affricate. Maybe a, well, be be a little more specific. We have to we have to somehow account for, and and keeping in mind, as I said, that it's easier to start with something and delete it, than it is to insert it out of the blue. What can we do to reconcile uh, this, uh, the mismatch in the environment, namely that sometimes they're they're wise and sometimes there aren't. Do you want to do you want to Oscar? Do you want to just push that a little further? Um, there used to be Y's and then they got deleted. Yeah. So suppose suppose we, we just reconstructed a theta that doesn't account for the Y. You'd have to insert the Y in order to get it get it there, right? So maybe uh, just as Oscar suggested, maybe we start with the Y and get rid of it when it doesn't. Uh, when we don't, when it doesn't show up. And that's this principle uh, based on uh, phonetic motivation of, uh, uh, or, or a desire to have phonetically motivated changes, the principle of, uh, or the, let's call it a rule of thumb because it's not exactly a principle, but that it's easier to start with something and delete it than it is to uh, insert it out of the blue. And that being the case, then we then we say, okay, well, let's start with the Y and we delete it when we need to. And that would be here, would be, uh, be here, here. But we don't delete it here because it shows up in, in, in the languages in that in in that word, in the in in, in those in the words that, that show it there at the end of the uh, data set, data set. Okay, so that's, that's we, we have, somehow we have to account for the why. And I, and remember I, I, I said, ultimately we would, I had hoped that we would do it two weeks ago, but, but we're, not, we're at a point where we can do it now. So we, we, do you all see that this is exactly the, a parallel situation to what we were just talking about with the TR and the S and the theta R in the Indo-Iranian? That we have, we have an, we start out with with a with a uh, a set here. This one, 
And we, in working towards the environment, we say, well, sometimes there's a why and sometimes there isn't. What do I make of that? Well, this, it, it, the zero, 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 why, why set is just as uh, viable or just as important a, a set for us to pay attention to as this one. I, I told you to pay attention to this one just for pedagogical reasons, but ultimately if we're reconstructing proto Bay, we're gonna to have to come up with a story, come up with some account of the, of the why that occurs in a couple of, of the languages in a couple of the words versus the zeros. Is everyone okay? Everyone sort of following me at, at, at this point? I see a couple of thumbs up. That's good. I like that. But I, I don't see any, any unhappy faces. But uh, tell me if this is confusing. I, waiting, 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 waiting. OK. I will assume that that's OK. So maybe if we decided to reconstruct theta for this set in order to account for the y, then we put when we simply include the y in our reconstruction like that. Now that commits us to saying that sometimes the Y appears in some of the languages and sometimes it doesn't, but that's something we would have to say, we would have to uh, build into our analysis in any case. Now, we can, is every, as long as everyone's with me, we can go one step further. And this is what I want you to, to, um, to go ooh and ah over because it's really pretty, a pretty cool methodological step. If we have theta plus y for this one, in order to account for the fact that some of the outcomes have a y in it, our y occurs only in 14 through 17. We didn't see it anywhere else, if you remember. So why don't we use one of our existing reconstructions, but add y to it? In other words, why don't we take the, the t that we reconstructed for, uh, for this set here, why don't we take that and say, well, what if we stick a Y in with that? Then we have, uh, we, we don't need then to reconstruct a separate <coughs> segment just for a different, a different proto-language segment just for this correspondence set. We can use one of the existing ones that we've already reconstructed recognizing that we need to say something about the why anyway, and say, well, it's this particular cluster that gives the outcome that we find. This accounts for the why. We do have to delete it where it doesn't show up, but it spares us one added reconstructed proto sound. We have to do something about the why anyway, so we're not violating Occam's razor. In fact, we're trying to be parsimonious as far as, as positing elements in the proto-language uh, is, is concerned. Okay, is this, I, 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 I can't look at your, I can't see your fa faces uh, entirely. So I, 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 this is a, uh, I see a couple, I see at least one thumbs up, thank you. Um, Couple, there's another one, good, good, good. Three, oh my God, that's more thumbs up than we've gotten about anything else. So this is, this is I think this is an, an analytic step that, is, that I think is really kind of cool when you, get, when, you, when you think about it, because it's, you're not violating any of the principles that we're talking about so far. It looks like you're saying, you might think, well, wait a minute, you're saying something extra, you're positing this combination. Yeah, but I've got to say something about that why anyway. So you are, <clears throat> you're being, uh, you're, at a, you're at a situation where Occam would say, well, really all things are equal because you have to account for that why somehow anyway. And look, if you do it this way, using the t, instead of inventing a new segment altogether, the theta, then you're really being parsimonious. You're making maximal use of the material at, at hand, which is really what, what parsimony is all about. So this, I think, is a really cool really interesting methodological step that, um, and I, and I, I, I hope it, it, it sinks in. I hope you, you understand what this is about. And it really comes out of our uh, uh, 
uh, the, the situation that I've referred to here as a composite reflex, where we have different environments, environments that don't match, and we have to somehow reconcile the, 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 the environments that don't match. Okay. So I'm going to assume, since no one's asking an overt, an, an overt question, and I see a few thumbs up, I'm going to assume that, that uh, this all uh, went down easily with you. And we will move on to something else. But this is, this is really sort of taking our method and pushing it to, to the limits. Now notice that, that um, we, we don't want to go uh, way overboard and suppose, so let me let me let me show you what going overboard would look like. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Good. So, going overboard would look like instead of so we we we're, we're redoing this one. Uh, this is a t We're redoing this one as uh, the, instead of theta, um, we're doing it as like that, okay? That's what we just, we just went through. Now, suppose I said, well, you know what? Uh, what if we did this one as y, y, and this one as like that, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is really cool. I can, I can, I can go one better on Occam's razor and and this one can then be how many? One, two, three, four, five. Right. So we have, and this we can just do as t plus y. So we have t plus y, t plus two y's, t plus three y's, t plus four y's, t plus five y's, right? I think I've done that right. One, two, three, four, five for the five different <coughs> uh, sets. Anyone want to react to that? How does that, how does that strike you? Is that, a, is that a good analysis? Would Occam be happy? Would any, any card carrying historical linguist be happy it's, with this? It's a no from Occam. A no from Occam, how come? It's just like excessive and Occam likes to keep it as few assumptions as possible. So what you're assuming here, uh, <clears throat> you're right, Kenna, and what you're assuming here is that is that in the proto-language there were these sort of multiple uh, instances of why that could concatenate that could that could be added to one another. You could get these composite y uh, t plus y t plus. Oh, I actually, I, I'm sorry. I, I see what I did wrong. We should uh, that could be t, and this could be two y's, and this could be three y's, and this could be four y's, and this could be one y. Yeah. So that's 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 that way we have. You would say, well, wait a minute, we only have two entities. We have a T and a Y. But what you're saying, Ken, is that really you're multiplying the entities. What, what you're multiplying is the ability to cluster together all of these, all of these Ys. And you're doing it in a, well, is it, um, how phonetically motivated is it? How many, can anyone, can anyone uh, imagine that there would be a language that would have this kind of set of contrasts? Now I know we don't have a lot of experience with uh, with typology. You're just sort of cutting your your eye teeth, as it were, with um, with uh, linguistics in general. But uh, Kenna is is dubious about there being languages that actually would have this kind of of uh, multiple clusterings of of why, and I and I think that that's exactly the right sensibility. But this this looks very unnatural. This looks like an unnatural uh, phonological contrast. 
or an unnatural, let's say an unnatural set of phonological contrasts. And so there's really another principle here that, that, that we can add in, which is sort of hovering over everything that we've been doing with, even though we haven't made it clear. And that is our reconstructions must be true to what we know about human language in general. So they must not violate uh, typological norms, let's say. Now, what constitutes <clears throat> naturalness, what constitutes a typological norm is a, uh, is a, uh, open to debate and that's it, to some extent it's an empirical matter do you find a language with this contrast you or not in amongst the 7000 or so languages of the world that we know um, that, but whatever whatever we uh, whatever we decide our uh, uh, we we have to uh, for our reconstructions they have to be reconstructions that are consistent with what we know about human language. They must uh, not violate typological norms. And the, um, um, what, what assumptions are, do we make about, um, about the, or what, what assumptions about the proto-language is, uh, is this consistent with? There was, a, there was a notion that we talked about very early on, I think it was on day one, actually, of this of this uh, class, when I, I took you on a on a on a virtual tour of um, of Mendenhall Labs. Do you remember? So what what was it about Mendenhall uh, Labs uh, that that figured into our discussion the first day? What do you remember? Anyone remember what uh, what uh, department is? housed in Mendenhall Labs? Geology. Yes, geology, right. And why was geology relevant for what we were talking about in historical linguistics or what we have been talking about? Well, how did I bring it in? Well, it, was, it wasn't just some crazy, uh, crazy notion. Uh, there, there was, there was a, a real motivation behind it. Does anyone recall what the, what the there was one notion in particular that we were, um, that, that we were aiming at, that we, de that, der that we use in, in historical linguistics that derived from uh, ge geological uh, considerations. Uniformitarianism? Right, uniformitarianism, good for you. And would you like to explain what uniformitarianism is? Kyle? So in geology, uniformitarianism is the idea that um, layers uh, within the uh, the uh, Earth's crust are uniform uh, depending on their, uh, so the, the farther down you go, the younger it is, and the higher up you go, the old, wait, is that right? Other no, way the way. other way, yeah. other way, yeah. <laughs> farther down you go, the older it gets, and each layer is going to be consistent at the same age. And, so in, and, and, and in general also, right, and in general, uh, more, or more generally, the processes that create the upper layers, the, the younger layers are the same processes that create the older layers. So uniformitarianism is really uniform across time as to the, uh, the processes that are involved in shaping uh, geological formations. How did we then, how did we take that uh, uh, in, or uh, how did we make use of that in, our, uh, in, in historical linguistics? What was the uh, what 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 assumptions? How did we use you know, that that notion of uniformitarianism and and uh, and implant it, if you will, into our into our historical linguistic uh, thinking? Can, um, can, you, can you go further? Which, yeah, yeah. So the process by which sound changes is regular in the same way that the process in which layers are created is regular. Not only regular. But regular across time, that is uniform across time. The same processes that are visible in the uh, in in going on in language today, we can impute to uh, to earlier stages of language as well, and that makes sense if we think about it. 
if we think so, who who was it? Who 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 was speaking these proto languages that we reconstruct? Who was speaking proto Polynesian? Who was speaking proto Germanic? Who was speaking proto Gbei? What what kind of what kind of of creature was speaking these these uh, proto languages? Humans in the past. Humans in the past. And, and so basically what we're saying is that in the same way that, that geology, the ge geological processes today are, are this, were the same as the, and, 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 and in the past were the same, were uniform. The speakers of today and the speakers of 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago, 500 years ago, were the same, we were humans, subject to the same kinds of, of uh, uh, constraints about the production of language, the same kinds of, of processes that lead to, to shaping sounds and, and, and so forth. So there's a uniformitarianism, there's a uniformity across time. And therefore, if we have an idea of what, of what uh, uh, a language should be like based on typological norms, based on an understanding of what uh, languages like today, we can use that to inform our um, reconstructions, to inform our view of what language was like at some point in the distant past. So the, the, so the fact that we're dealing with humans, human speakers, whether it's speakers of Proto-Polynesian, whether it's speakers of proto Bay, whether it's speakers of Proto-Germanic, whether it's speakers of Elizabethan English, whether it's speakers of ancient Greek, whatever, any language you want to, you want to take. <clears throat> the assumption that they were humans who were speaking that is really uh, telling us that, that anything that we find out about language today, we can use in informing our uh, view of what language was like in the, in the past, in the distant past. So there's a uniformitarianism in the same, in language, in the same way that there's a geological uniformitarianism in the processes that shape the upper layers and the lower layers in a, uh, in a geological uh, formation, the different strata in a ge geological formation. So that's why our reconstructions must be true to what we know about human language in general, because of our assumption of uniformitarianism. Now, this all seems very you know, philosophical and so forth, but if we go back to this, key notions, I kind of over, <clears throat> I, I alluded to this at one point, but let's think about the, uh, the relationship between synchrony and diachrony. I, I, I've mentioned this, that, that, uh, I think, but this, this sort of uh, illustrates it in a schematized way. At any particular point in time, whether we're talking about say Old English or Middle English or modern Elizabethan English or modern English, like you did in that very first uh, uh, homework exercise or that very first uh, uh, class exercise, <clears throat> those are synchronic stages. So the English of 900 AD is a synchronic stage. The English of 1600 AD is a, is a synchronic stage. The English of 2021 is a synchronic stage. But how do we get diachrony? Well, diachrony is the passage through time. We said that, the passage through time of language, um, or really of any human institution, but we get linguistic diachrony as the passage through time. But passage through time is really passage through successive synchronic stages. And it's how, how finely we cut those synchronic stages is a matter of, of some uh, analytic, uh, really involves analytic decisions, but we can, if we can notice changes even within our lifetime, then we perhaps have to, have to be able to, to cut things relatively finely. If there's, if there's an innovation in 2021 or 2020, we had all kinds of new words associated with COVID, uh, with the pandemic that, that had never, either had never been uh, invented before, like the name COVID, or had um, had never been used in that um, in that in in a general arena, like um, um, uh, the uh, protective PPE for protect uh, personal protective uh, equipment or contact tracing. Those were terms that were used in 
in public health or in the health uh, sector, but they, they became much more general. So, the, so we can have innovations in a relatively short period of time, but at the same time, uh, we can also take a broader picture and say, well, there's, you know, COVID is, that's just one little one word, but uh, how about all of the changes in the pronouns and the verb endings and, uh, and the pronunciation of sounds and so forth, those add up over longer periods of time. So, um, <clears throat> so how finally we cut the synchronic stage uh, this is, is a matter of really ne necessity. It would be crazy for us to say that the synchronic English of, uh, Amer synchronic American English of 1224 on, <clears throat> um, on February 22nd, uh, 2021, as opposed to, oops, it just changed to 1225. <clears throat> so uh, we're in a new synchronic stage. And if we wait another minute, we'll be in another synchronic stage. That's clearly cutting things way too finely. But, um, but uh, however finally we cut them, we get diachrony by really passing through successive synchronic stages. And what determines the shape of any synchronic stage is really the constraints that are uh, part of, that, that, that tell us what uh, human language is about. So the constraints that hold at any synchronic stage are the constraints that hold uh, on human language in general. And therefore the passage, the diachrony, the passage through these successive synchronic stages has to be true to what we know about human language in general. So this is, this is by way of coming back to uh, what I just said here about our reconstructions. And that's why this reconstruction here with all of these, all these pile, Y is piling up, it might look parsimonious in that we only have a T and we only have a Y, but even if we uh, even if we grant that it's parsimonious, and, and as Kenneth said, it it, it maybe uh, isn't quite uh, as parsimonious as we think because it's positing all of these uh, uh, crazy clusters. <clears throat> but even if it looks parsimonious, it still would violate. It would go. It would be an unnatural set of phonological contrasts, and would violate what we know about human language in general. So that's yet another condition, another principle that we need to keep in mind. It kind of hovers over everything. Since we're dealing with human language, it has to be a viable, what we reconstruct, what we talk about, what we think about has to be a viable human language. Okay, I'm gonna stop uh, at this point. I have more things to tell you, of course, but uh, they can wait till next week. No class on Wednesday. If you show up, I won't be here. Uh, so take, 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 the, the idea of a break seriously, please, and have a good uh, couple of days, and I will see you all then a week from uh, today. Okay, great. As always, thank you, and uh, take care, stay healthy, enjoy yourselves. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Dr. Bye, Joseph, everyone. do you have a minute? Uh, sure, yeah. Okay, um, uh, let, I would let, just let, like- Hang on, let, let me stop recording. Uh,